and never fails. One that leads to success in the workplace as well as at home and in your personal lives. If so, we would accept it as a true plan of success. Okay. <coughs> One measured on principles that would pass the test of truth. That is, it would have worked in the past, it would work today and it should always work in the future let me quote a modern scripture truth is knowledge of things as they are and as they were and as they are to come and whatsoever is more or less than this is the spirit of that wicked one who is a liar from the beginning i began to look for a business plan that would pass the test of truth i decided that such a plan would have to be part of doctrine taught by the great master teacher himself. I believe that whatever he taught was and is the ultimate success plan for the human family. And I believe what he taught for us individually also can apply collectively and for every activity we're involved in, uh, in the business world as well as anything else. Upon this premise, I'm here today to propose to you my discovery of a winning plan leading to success based on the truest principle of success given to man. Obviously, I didn't invent it, but I have applied it in my own way in the business world, and it works. I discovered that it continued to work year after year, and I believe it will work for each one of you. I believe that in every facet of your upcoming career, I believe it will open up the way for you to rise to the top. And I believe if you apply it, you will win a crown of success in the world of business as well as in your personal life. There are many examples I can give you showing how this plan can work. I'll discuss a few of them. In addition, I'll provide my own personal example of using it. Spanning over a period of 10 years, working with a global billion dollar company out of Houston, Texas. Others have discovered this plan and have implemented it. I must tell you, however, it's not the easiest path. It often bucks the tide. Many times it goes up river against the wind. It will be like climbing up to the Y on the side of the mountain. Most people like something quick and easy and socially acceptable, but this plan is often difficult. It will take energy and persistence, and it also will take faith. Now let me just say that all our actions are built on faith. We learned to walk by wobbling up on our weak legs. We did it over and over until we could take some steps. And then more steps. And why did we do it? Because we observed that the big people around us were doing it. After observing it over a period of months, we attained the faith that we could do it. Faith produced the confidence we needed to take action. As you enter your careers and you find that you're going against the tide, upwind, upstream, you will need to have faith in the principle that you plan and apply, or you will quit and join the tide. You'll let the wind blow you every which way. You must have faith to know that the strategy, based on true principles, will work. I discovered, as I'm sure you have also, that there are things that are true, and there are, then there are things that are made up. Sometimes made up things have enough mixture of truth to sound extremely enticing and worthwhile. So I stress a, uh, the application of a successful plan will be built upon a principle that always works. And then you will keep your path with dedication and persistence once you know it's true. In the end, your perseverance will make the difference. Now speaking of things both true and made up, there are thousands of books that are being written, published, hundreds of seminars being provided across the country every year, all presenting a lot of ideas on how to succeed. Which books should you choose? Which seminars are you going to attend? 
Many will inspire and motivate you. So with all these, what principles of success, success are you going to pattern your career path on? Let me read something that uh, always impressed me. It was actually written by Paul in the New Testament. He was speaking about our modern era when he described mainstream America and Europe. In fact, he described the whole world, including the world of business, science, and the arts. He said about the people in our day, ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Today, learning has become abundant. Universities abound, millions of books, magazines, publications, everywhere. Unbelievable scientific advancements, information freely dispensed, like never before in history. We're truly in the middle of the explosive information age. We're all familiar with this little stone. No matter where we go, day or night, it provides discovery and learning to defy all of our imagination. And if it gets more than three feet away from us, we start to get nervous. <laughs> we belong to a society that is ever learning, but not always finding the truth. In our discussion today, I propose that in your plan for attaining success, you should discern and earnestly ask yourself, is the foundation of it something you can believe in wholeheartedly? If so, your faith, or in other words, your confidence, will motivate and lead you to follow and attain success. All other forms of learning could be a wandering path which will take you every which way. And if you're lucky, sometimes it'll have good results and sometimes it won't. This is the thinking that I went through when I began to be my discovery of how to succeed in the business world and in the workplace. And now I want to reveal what I discovered with you. And you probably won't be surprised after revealing it, I will then show you examples of how it works in the business world. I call it ETS, or in other words, eliminate the spots. I was watching a program on TV the other day. It was a discussion about who's the greatest football coach of all time. Would anybody like to venture who I'm thinking of? <clears throat> greatest football coach of all time. Bear Bryant. That's not the one I'm thinking of. <laughs> Lombardi. Uh, good guess, not the one I'm thinking of. Mike Ditka. <laughs> another good guess. Who had another hand? I was going to say Lombardi as well. Okay. Actually, it was Coach Saban of Alabama. It was a remarkable discussion that I viewed. He has won three titles in a row, four titles in the last five years, and going for another this year undefeated. He's almost unstoppable. And you know what is the most remarkable thing about him? He doesn't talk with his team about winning. Never mentions winning. He simply works on every play, going over it and over it, taking out the errors to perfect it, play by play. He doesn't worry about the scoreboard either. It's each and every play. Each play stands on its own merit. He studies each one with a microscope, inspiring each player to perfect their movements by eliminating errors. His success is based on perfecting each process, one after another. And guess what? The scores come naturally, even without thinking about it. That's the amazing principle. This is the whole beauty of applying true principles that always work. You don't have to frustrate yourself with the ups and downs of winning or losing. You simply work on taking out the spots and perfecting each play, or in the business sense, each process, eliminating the errors one process at a time. Now, all business activity is composed of processes, as you already know. In my work, it required the following important activities to successfully rid processes of spots. These same activities can work for almost every assignment in almost any company. First, define the processes you will be focusing on. Then gather enough data to convince others that your program will reduce problems and save the company money. Second, form teams, first-line supervisors, directly involved in the processes that you're focused on. Third, don't allow management persons to participate, except for yourself. 
and in your case, apply shadow leadership so the teams will become self-initiating. There's an important principle here. Fourth, set up a reporting system to identify the problems. Fifth, begin having the teams document every problem and meet periodically to resolve each problem so as to prevent, prevent reoccurrence. Sixth, publish the <coughs> results of all teams. Now I'll discuss more about these steps a little later. It doesn't matter what type of company you choose to work for, every company's objective can only be accomplished by a series of processes. Your aim would be to understand the processes, identify the problems, and remove the spots. I was watching a, another program recently. It was about the best runners in the world. I can't remember the runner's name, but it was a study about one such runner who was always just behind the fastest runners in the world. And uh, it seemed he seemed to plateau at a certain level, and he just couldn't get beyond it. A level, by the way, which was astoundingly good. But he wanted to be better. They began to study the small movements of the fastest runners. On camera, slow motion, each movement was dissected and analyzed until they discovered something <coughs> was wrong. They found the error in the runner's leg movements, something they didn't know before until they took the effort to analyze and study the, the microscopic detail. The runner was not coming down on his heel with enough downward force. When this downward force of each step was increased, it produced a greater upward bounce or motion of the next step. They experimented with this working with the runner, practicing over and over. As he began to correct the error, he began to get more bounce and each step produced another half inch of stride. That was enough. He began to win race after race. It was automatic. Once the error was eliminated, or should I say, once the spot was taken out, the runner's own natural abilities produced the winning result. ETS is getting rid of the spots. Now there's another name for it, by the way, in religious circles. It's called repentance. From a personal standpoint, as you work on removing spots, the good that is already within you can begin to blossom. Each of us come down here to earth, pure and white as the driven snow. But then we begin to see things happen around us. We get taught incorrect principles. We fall into traditions without even knowing it. We get hurt, we get jealous, we get angry. We form bad habits that stay with us for many years. We might even commit moral or ethical sins which drag us down. In summary, we get caked over with moral weaknesses that hide the noble and pure qualities of the human soul. The great truth about ETS is that it is based on a belief that every human soul is good and will succeed except they are hindered by negative spots. Personal success will only be mastered as you get rid of these spots, these bad habits and weaknesses, false beliefs and negative thinking and awkward social attitudes. It is no different whether you're working on you personally, or a team of people, or a whole company. Getting rid of spots will allow the natural, rich qualities of successful attitudes to blossom. I've seen it happen over and over again. It's actually a miracle built into human sociality. Some people teach that if you pretend to be successful, dress the right way, repeat positive self-aggrandizing statements to up your confidence, it will lead to success. But with ETS, there's no pretense. It will come naturally as you take the spots out. <clears throat> the reason is founded on the belief that the human soul is already instilled with successful attributes. We just have to get rid of the spots that cover them up. The problem <coughs> removal starts with the biggest spots first. They're easy to find. Once gone, you can see more clearly and soon you're working on smaller ones, and eventually even the microscopic ones that you never imagined existed. This will come naturally as you and the team continue to stay focused on your objectives. Every company has untold thousands of spots and such problems in their processes, and most of the time they don't even know it. 
This becomes your opportunity as you graduate and enter into the world of business. Now let me turn to my own experience. I was assigned as a senior negotiator for my company over the transportation of liquid oils and chemicals across the nation. It was a stewardship of about $100 million a year. In the 10 years that I had the assignment, that amounted to a billion dollars. My job was to negotiate contracts with third-party contractors to get the job done and save the company money. This is just a little representation of my toys that I brought uh, for my assignment. And no, I'm not giving them away after the presentation. <laughs> <Someone has it. laughs> I expanded my assignment to address methods that I might employ to take the spots out of the processes of third-party negotiations as well as out of the processes of storage, loading, transporting, and delivery of the product. I had complete faith that I could eliminate the spots or problems existing in each process by employing the principles of ETS. I believe strongly that people are creative and will blossom with productivity when the spots holding them back are removed. So I set out to get it started. Discovery number one, there were over 200 different products, each requiring special trucks, unique unloading equipment for each family of products, specialized and complicated cleaning methods, and a specific list of loading and unloading requirements for each product involving different persons in the company loading the product as well as third-party contractors transporting and unloading the product. Each load had a sales value between thirty dollars and $150,000. I analyzed the overall activity and discovered that only 78% of deliveries appeared problem-free. That meant 22% or over 23,000 deliveries each year had problems. I analyzed the cost of these problems and found the average cost to fix them to be about $500. That amounted to $11 million a year. And over the period of 10 years that I had the assignment, it amounted to $110 million. Everyone simply had figured that it was the cost of doing business. And the problems went on year after year. Not just with our business, but with all of our competition in the industry. Discovery number two, I found antiquated processes for negotiating rates which, had, uh, rates which had been in place over many years. Even though technology had advanced, the processes became overburdened with manpower, taking weeks and months of preparation to analyze and negotiate rates. The hundred or so transportation companies we dealt with and that I worked with, uh, it was to their advantage. And no one before myself had thought to change it. It was welded to the good old boy concept of not rocking the boat. At its foundation was a bidding process built on competition. However, the competition was quietly feeding an old process to keep the rates camouflaged with extra margins. And no one was willing to take the effort to change it. This was costing untold millions of dollars, but it was not recognized because competition had the same extra cost in their rates. And so, as long as we were competitive, everybody was happy. Discovery number three. Because of these problems, there were safety issues that were flaring up constantly, causing teams of management manpower invested into investigating, finger pointing, and punishing the offenders. As long as someone was punished, upper management was satisfied that the problem was resolved. Now, a note about ETS. ETS is a cost reduction program. As you have already learned in your business classes, a dollar of cost reduction is a full dollar of profit. However, a dollar of sales effort produces only a small percentage of profit. Or in my industry, only two to four cents of every dollar was profit. Obviously, a company that avoids cost reduction can go out of business quickly. The only reason my company had been successful rested on the fact that all their competition had the same cost problems, so the field was even. But as far as my assignment went, it was about to change. Most of my peers who had similar responsibilities over different segments of the business, uh, such as railroad transportation, shipping, international shipping, worked hard just to keep their costs competitive. 
Using ETS and employing team effort, I saved my company compared to competition on rates an average of $11 million a year or $110 million over the 10 year period. Recognition of my work was slow at the start, but gained momentum sufficient to prove my case. I was soon given autonomous control to expand it into all divisions. In addition, I was given an unlimited expense account and budget to travel, entertain, implement, and do whatever I felt necessary to move the program forward. My peers were very jealous of what happened. I would have rather had a percentage of the savings, but they wouldn't do that. Just 1% would have been enough. <laughs> so this is what I did. First and foremost, in the beginning, I analyzed my assignment and identified enough problems and put a rough estimate of dollars to it so that I convinced upper management to let me proceed. That step always has to be in place. You need that endorsement. Second, I organized various teams around the country. I organized each team with the lowest level of supervisors that were involved with all the various processes. In all cases, these teams involved people from different divisions as well as outside contract carriers who made the deliveries. A few of the division managers over some of these team persons were not convinced that their people should participate. That is, they didn't want to give up control of a team not entirely under their jurisdiction. But having attained upper management endorsement at the beginning and with that, they had to concede. However, once problems began disappearing and savings began occurring, each of these division managers were very quick to endorse and take credit for the results. I took the role of silent leadership, another important principle of ETS, meaning I initiated the meetings, set up the structure and rules of how they were to be ran, established a reporting system of progress, but never took personal credit for the results. I wanted each team member to get that credit through their uh, own management. This ensured that the program would continue and last even after I was gone. I made sure all persons on the team were created equal, including the contractors. The meetings always included lunch in a casual setting without suits, ties, or any formality. It was important that each team member not be allowed to state anything good that was happening. Now this is a, the, uh, the most important principle because that's what they normally did. They came to management and told them all about all the good things they were doing. The meeting was to consist entirely of identifying things that went wrong since the last meeting and discuss each problem and come to team consensus on how to resolve them. This was very difficult with contractors who before this had always come to the meetings connected with higher management people wearing their suits and their ties and rehearsing all the good they were doing. They would always treat management with a restaurant lunch and have a lot of good old boy talk, tying their performance to these relationships rather than what was happening in the field. In my arrangement, I no longer allowed them to meet with upper management except for myself. I was their sole doorway to the company and they quickly learned that I had the power to remove them if they were not 100% involved with the new program. They did not like to talk about mistakes they made. However, when they finally understood that their performance was now going to be based on how many problems they discovered and brought to the table, they slowly began to set up analyses and internal systems to find and discover them. Next, I set up a reporting system which tracked every problem throughout the system through this team effort. Each contractor and each team was given the information about every other team. The resulting competition spurred a continual increase in team results. After a while, the contractors learned to enjoy, even to love, the new program. They found out they could reveal problems they caused and they were not punished or looked down upon. They were actually applauded for bringing problems to the table. And when they realized that the whole team was there to help them resolve those problems, they totally bought into it. What they liked most was they could reveal problems that our company was causing them, which affected them. And again, without reprisal, the team worked on how to resolve these as well. And by the way, we ended up finding as many problems with our own processes as we did with contractors. 
However, I should state before I started this program, the contractors got blamed for everything. They had to pay punitive fines and some were fired, and I believe half the time it was our fault. Each team member was encouraged to take the same interest in solving problems that belonged to the other team members. They soon realized how much their stewardships were connected and dependent upon processes from other divisions and these contractors. The results were absolutely amazing. In due course, month by month, the ratio of problems went from 22% to 19, then to 16, then to 12, and so on until we brought them all the way down to 1.5%. That meant that all processes became 98.5 cents problem free. It was astounding. Everyone was amazed. Management was happy. The contractors were happy. Customers were getting better service. Supervisors began to have more time on their hands to be creative. And contractors, instead of getting fired, were becoming efficient and effectively trained in their work. I soon realized that applying ETS had a, another maturing effect on its own, and it was about to open up a whole new opportunity. Once the large spots were cleared, then smaller spots could be cleared. And once these disappeared, there began to be an upflow of creative ideas on how to improve processes. The purity of the human soul was beginning to blossom. The persons involved with company, as well as the contractors, began to propose ideas, suggestions, and convince management to put money into improvement processes never before thought of. It was amazing to see the pure principles of ETS working. Remove the spots, and the human soul blossoms with creativity and desires to do good. With problems on the downturn, it was now time to negotiate tougher rates. I did away with bidding contracts. I eliminated all one-year and two-year contracts, replacing them with everlasting contracts, which could be term terminated at any time based on performance. My peers in the business said I was foolish and that it wouldn't work, that contractors would not invest in enough equipment and time without a secure contract. But my peers didn't realize that the ETS program was making our contractors more efficient and problem-free than any of their competition, so their standing with the company was never more secure. Next, I formed contracts which were based on a single formula for each shipping site and never took more than one page of the contract. Prior to this, contract rate pages normally consisted of about 45 sheets, sometimes up to 90. <coughs> I became notorious in the industry with having only one page rate contracts, never allowing it to go to the second page. <coughs> this simple method allowed computerization of rate processing to replace another half million dollars of manpower every year. Next, I began to negotiate the actual reductions and prove statistically to our contract carriers that their more problem-free relationship merited lower rates. I also recognized that they needed a secure profit as long as it was reasonable. There was to be no more fluff, what I call fluff, that is, they had established rates on a cost-driven basis without anticipating any increases in factors such as rising fuel costs, labor negotiations, or new taxes. No anticipated increases for inflation was allowed. But yet, if in reality a situation arose that affected rising costs in their industry, contract changes were always open for discussion. As a result of all this, I ended up with the lowest rates in the industry nationwide, about $8 million less than any competitors each year. Contractors were making their profits, customers were happy, and uh, my stewardship in the company was uh, the leanest in the industry. After I left the company, I was pleased to find out that the entire industry had adopted my streamlined formula rate program. During the 10 years of my assignment, I had been responsible for saving my company 110 million in spot reductions, 80 million in rate reduction, 5 million in department overhead. At the same time, many people learned to enjoy their work and became creative and happy in their assignments. In summary, I employed, to, to repeat a little bit, uh, I employed these core principles. Number one, removing spots, problems, and negative activities will automatically induce success 
whether in our personal lives or whether in the workplace. Two, people deep down are good and want to do good when their spots are removed. <coughs> Three, teams work best at the lowest levels of supervision. We can, uh, wrong page. Number four, team persons must have mutual respect for each other, which is only achieved when all persons are equal in participation. Meeting rules disallow discussions that stray from problem identification and resolution. The ETS instigator must work as a shadow leader, allowing team members to claim credit for the progress that is being made. And then final, re finally, report overall success to upper management in order to preserve continuing buy-in to sustain the program. At the beginning, I talked about the value of having a plan based on true principles. ETS is simply a slogan based on the teachings of the great master teacher who also created our world. He taught that we must have faith, and then he taught that we must repent. This one principle has the power to break us loose from stagnation and confinement of negative thinking, wrongdoing, old traditions, guilt, and self-worthlessness. It is a purifying principle. It cleans things up. It frees the spirit. Only then can the spirit blossom with its natural love for creativity, goodness, and virtue. In the New Testament, the Apostle John defines seven ultimate success objectives in his letters to the seven churches. If you examine his writings carefully, you will realize that the seven objectives represent the ultimate success that anybody in this world could yearn to achieve. He also gave the formula for achieving these seven objectives. In fact, he repeated the formula seven <coughs> times. We could slogan his three words, as I did for ETS, and call it HWO, meaning him who overcometh. Again, getting rid of spots. The caked on negatives of mortality is what overcoming is all about. We are pure, noble children of an almighty God. We have his attributes of perfection in embryonic proportion. We don't have to improve upon these attributes. We simply need to remove the spots that cover them up. Overcoming is one and the same as removing spots. When we eliminate a spot, we overcome it. Now, let's see. What do I do now? Please. Yeah. Overcoming is one and the same as removing spots. When we eliminate a spot, we overcome it, and we keep repeating the process. The day will come when all negative inclusions, all the problems, all the spots will be gone, and ultimate success, success will simply be at our doors. When I applied in the workplace, I found that this same miracle can transpire. Efficiency and cost savings materialized. Profits grew and the price of goods and merchandise were reduced. Everyone benefits. The managers, the stockholders, the employees, the customers, and the contractors. I challenge you to go forward in the business world with a desire to clean out the spots. <coughs> Wherever you are and whatever assignments you're given, it's a true principle. It works. Thank you, and good luck to all of you. And by the way, my current career, I'm a real estate broker, so if any of you end up staying in Utah once you get your jobs, I'll be glad to help you with your new home. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, we have some uh, time now, so if any of you have any questions or uh, we've got decades of experience standing up here, so fire away, if you're okay with that. Oh, I'm okay, I just you. set you up. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, I mean, <clears throat> the reason why like, I really wanted you to come was because last year during Cindy Wallen's class, she's a professor in one of the supply chain classes, she taught a whole semester about, like, you should do all these kinds of things, and what you just said was, like, exactly what she said to do, and she had all these guest speakers come. And like they all had like, oh, well, I don't do the, you know, that's too hard to do or those kind of thing. And when James told me like that you actually did all these things and it actually led to success, 
like it was just kind of pretty amazing and I didn't know if the fish really was this big but it turned out to be that big um, but I mean what gave you the courage at that point in your career you had already been with the company for that long for like 20 had 20 years at the time I mean you know it, it's not like you could have just decided to be stuck in your ways I mean how I suppose you were, I was always sort of a maverick in the yeah. business uh, doing things similar I could probably tell you some other things that happened before that, but this one had the most dollar effect. But it, you know, it was really simple. Once you believe in the principle to be a true principle, because that automatically comes with faith. And therefore you have no fear because you know it works. And I knew that would work somehow. Um, repentance personally is what elevates us. We become more pure every time we do so, and as we become more pure, we get more light, and the additional light reveals more spots that we didn't see before. So if it works with us personally, I said, why wouldn't this work in business? It would, or anywhere. So I just went forward down the road, and I was really amazed at the results myself. So I'm just wondering how you developed this very um seems like a very complete model, right? Where you, you kind of knew to take the man the higher management out and, and gave that responsibility to them. You put the checks and balances in place. You became that silent leader. I mean, those all really sound like, you know, they all kind of go together. But how did you put that together? I mean, some people will say, oh, look, and then look at all the credit I've done. And, and you know, and then they don't get that lower credit. So how did you come up with each of these processes? I'm now? not sure. It kind of developed. <laughs> okay. Um, for example, a question I would ask you, what would happen if upper management had been in these meetings? What do you think would happen? The whole thing would crater. Upper management doesn't want details. They, they, they want to command. They want to say, no, this is what's right, this is what's right. We didn't need that. I knew that if we went to the lowest level of supervision, who actually are there to get the job done, that they would have the real answers. Upper management wouldn't have the answers. They're, they're always, you know, the big picture. <coughs> These were details, small spots. Big spots at first, but small spots. So I knew that we had to get together everybody that had response, first line supervision over the processes that were actually taking place. So I knew that. So that kind of drew then into teams. And then once we formed teams, I knew that we needed to be informal we need to do to, uh, now in the past, management looked upon carriers and said, hey, we have a problem, blame them. They're the cause of everything, you know. Get rid of them or punitive punishment or whatever. It was totally taking a good contractor and driving them down. And then if you don't like them, change them and now you go through the same thing with the next carrier. And that's what was happening over through the years. So I knew that somehow, we needed to preserve these carriers, help them remove their spots. They would become great carriers for us. And uh, so that kind of led to the way in which we had the meetings. The other thing I knew is that everybody likes to hide spots. Don't you like to hide spots? Right. We do, don't we? <laughs> kind of natural. We, we don't want to reveal negative things about ourselves. Certainly these carriers who were receiving money from the company didn't want to say anything that they were doing wrong. So I knew that in these meetings, we had to have a different philosophy. I could not allow them to come in and start talking about what they were doing good. It had to be simply on problems. And it took about, it took each one of these contractors probably about uh, three or four meetings before they finally felt like we weren't going to get those problems and then hit them. We were going to actually do something very valuable. And they began to love it. It was unheard of in the industry, actually. So you have like an initial rollout of your program. What was your involvement with these meetings and things like that after that Total initial Total and complete meeting? involvement. I was always in every meeting. So uh, I had in the meeting, I structured one person to kind of be in charge. Again, shadow leadership. And I would have uh, work through that person to set up these meetings. But I was always there because if I wasn't there, I knew what would happen. It would, uh, it would start going back to the other way. And I was the one that could fire these carriers or hire them or whatever. So 
that was needed in the meeting to make sure that we followed the agenda, at least at first. So you mentioned assigning one person to be in charge of the meetings. Could you talk a little more about the silent leadership or shadow managing? Uh, how you? Well, in other words, I could have actually came into the meeting and said, okay, this is when we're going to have the meeting, this is how it's going to be, this is whatever. But by having someone kind of as the chairman of each team, then they set up the meeting, they set up the place, they set up all of those things. Um, they brought lunch in. Next time, one of the carriers would bring lunch in, etc. So that they had kind of a, a sense of control but it wasn't the real substance. The real substance was what I demanded in each meeting, but in just a soft way presented what it was going to be and then kind of went from there. And at that point, then I just became a participant. Found a problem, let's discuss it, let's resolve it, let's make sure it doesn't happen again. Let's go to the next problem, resolve it, make sure it doesn't happen again. I just became one of the team members. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. How did you sustain yourself when you were really making constant visits of your problem? Generally, people like this. Like, the way I see it, um, like Heavenly Father, when he created the earth, he always took time afterwards to look at and see what he was doing. And your approach was, I don't really want to hear about the good right now. Let's, let's focus on the problems. How did you sustain yourself, like, almost psychologically? Because... The good came later. Okay. As everything started working, the carriers, the uh, different division people, the supervisors, they came together in these meetings and had total fun at it. It became fun. It wasn't a dreary thing. It was joyful because it was actually happening. <coughs> Costs were going down and problems were getting resolved. So the good kind of blossomed. And then this creativity and all that that happened, it, it kind of, everybody started to have fun at their work. So the good in it came, and it was almost silent. Everybody knew it. And of course, sooner or later, um, you know, you begin to get applauded for your efforts and so on, and everybody basically received credits for what was happening. The supervisors, by their division managers, upper management, of course, you know, like I say, gave me almost... I, no one supervised me. They turned me loose and said, "Do whatever, spend whatever, keep it going." I mean, it was a, it was like a corporate heaven for me. <laughs> so, so I had a second question. Um, I think this is the first time in my life that I've heard to take your managers out. So what I wanted to know, and it's kind of a fascinating principle. Uh, what I wanted to know is what, if you can remember, is the situation where you. I learned it because when I first took this job, and as we had contractors come in, they always met with this upper management people who were always pounding on them, pounding away, making them pay for fines, uh, wanting to have discussions to fire them. It was all negative. And I just figured, hey, we've, we've got to turn that around. That had to be gone. And so the first thing I did was to go to upper management, present what I wanted to do, and got enough buy-in that I could begin the process. And then as results started happening and they saw that, they were happy to, happy to not participate because they were seeing what was happening. So it, it kind of worked. It's amazing what a true principle will do when you stick to it. The results came. Kind of like, there they are. They come naturally. It's really amazing. Yeah. How do you incentivize people to make their problems transparent? And then how do you keep people from like purposely making problems because if they're incentivized? To <coughs> you know, I never thought of that one. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's a natural tendency not to make a problem. Uh, these were all good people. They wanted to succeed. They had supervisors over them and managers, etc. So they were trying to do a good job. Um, uh, I, I don't know if I quite understand your question. So what was it that like finally got people to want to make their like own problems transparent? Like, 
Oh, to make them uh, visible. Yeah. The fact that in these meetings, and it took, like I say, about three meetings, that said all we're going to talk about is problems. I had I, that was the one thing I had to stick to. And so some of the meetings at the beginning didn't have a whole lot to talk about, except the real blaring problems, you know, an accident or this or that. <coughs> talk about. But as the meetings progressed, they began to realize that even if we had these problems, we weren't going to fire them. We weren't going to dismiss them. We were going to resolve each one, find out what caused it so it never happened again. And what we also found was one division needed the support of the other division because there were connected processes. The contract carriers had totally connected processes. So once they began to see that all these things could be cleared of these spots, it was helping them. So kind of, again, kind of a natural thing that, that took an effort. In fact, if they came in with a tie, we, we would cut it in half, throw it away. We didn't let them come in in any way to talk about how great they were, you know. Yeah, we're doing a good job. Let, we just did this and we did that. You know, there are other places they could do that. In this meeting, only problems. So I guess it was perseverance to do that. Um, like you mentioned, you had like 90, 90 plus carriers, right? Or subcontractors. Um, from the beginning of this process to the end, from I mean, the meetings to the uh, negotiations to reduce price, the changing in the pricing and everything like that, did you lose some of those contractors? And if so, what was the main reason? Did, did, what did you last? lose some of them? Did you have to, some of them just maybe didn't perform like you needed them to and weren't resolving their problems like they... I, mean, I never you, lost a contractor. Okay. Before time, it was a constant change. Right. Um, but what I did is I just took what we had. Well, we only lost some... Uh, a few simply because the ones that really took on to the program began to get more business from us. And so some got so small that they kind of went away, but only a few. I believe that no matter who they were, they would soon buy into this program and it would work. And it did. And they ended up loving it. And they got so far ahead of their competition as far as how they dealt with us, and they were able to train their people with the extra time and everything that they be, they actually became very good. We didn't want to lose any of them. And it, that was amazing in and of itself. Upper management couldn't believe that we could hang on to these guys for so long and they would do such a good job. Yeah, yeah my question is in line with this question. I personally think that uh, giving the number of pages of a contract from 45 to 1 is remarkable. So how did you maintain the relationship with contract? I'm sure you would have faced a lot of difficulties because it's it's difficult to do then say it, right? So how did you do that? The, exactly what now? What? <coughs> the number of pages of a contract. Oh, getting yeah. it down to one. So cutting down the fluff. Well, when I first went into this thing, it was, you know, everybody was negotiating rates with their segment of the business. And it was like a three month project to negotiate for one contractor. Um, now, naturally, ExxonMobil is a big company, so there's a lot of dollars uh, with these contractors. But I thought, I thought something is not, this isn't right. This is too much time. Got to get out there and, and remove spots. I don't want to mess around doing all this. So, when I began this process, I realized that somehow we had to simplify that. And so, I simply devised a formula. Now the formula was the key. Before you would take, let's say, um, let's say there's 10 locations that you deliver out of. So, and then out of those uh, locations, you might deliver, you know, a, a thousand different places. So rather than uh, go into some analysis of each place and then sum up the total and get the average, which was always static because the next year those places could change. And all this time that was spent in it, I thought something's foolish here, this isn't right. And by the way, all it did was kind of hide everything. By the time you were done, you didn't know where you stood with anything because it was too hard to figure out all these thousands of numbers that were in there. And I began to realize that in these processes, you can formulize. 
And so I simply, by every shipping location, formulized it. You know, so many dollars plus so many cents per mile plus this or that, whatever uh, was in the marketplace came up with that formula. That formula was the key. Once I knew that I could do that, I knew that I had to go to one page. So, and I became, I suppose, a little bit famous in the industry because everybody called me the one page, you know, guy. Uh, but by keeping it to one page, we kept it simple because carriers had this, contractors had this concept that they had to make things really long so you couldn't figure it out too much. I wouldn't let them do that. So formula, one page, no longer. It worked. Yes. What was the biggest challenge along the way implementing the process and seeing it through? Getting the support of different divisions to supply the people needed in these teams. They just didn't want to give up control. That was, they were the uh, field operating people. I was somebody from headquarters they didn't like. You know, you never like people from headquarters. <laughs> so uh, getting that division buy-in, I knew I had to get somebody that was over them, somebody that had greater authority than they in order to make it happen. So that the important step was getting that initial buy-in from upper management to move ahead. Uh, but it still was a problem until we started getting results. And like I say, that turned around pretty quick. They began sponsoring teams and giving them extra money for lunches and ideas and creativity and things like that. It was pretty amazing also. Yes. So what made you or uh, allow you to branch out from the good old boy system? Because you had mentioned that a couple of times. And I would imagine that would be rather difficult. Um, you know, to go against the grain of what everyone's doing while our costs are relative to the market. So to be able to say, well, let's dig down deeper to see if we can save that. That was the second doing. greatest challenge. Yeah. And that was simply because I had authority to fire them. Mm -hmm. They knew it. I didn't have to say it. <laughs> but if they didn't do what I wanted in these meetings, they knew, when they knew that we were going to applaud them for problems that they bring on the table, when they finally got that, they realized this was important. If they didn't do this, if they didn't bring problems to the table, we were going to actually rate them very poorly. So this uh, rating, this uh, report that I made up emphasized the number of problems they brought to the table. And if it was very low, that was a bad rating. Mm -hmm. So it was just constantly driving that principle. And though I had the power to fire them, I never had to do that because they did buy in. It, I was really amazed. It wasn't something that I knew ahead of time that would bring about this uh, whole effort of creativity and everything. But it gave me a confirmation that a true principle will always work. And where better to go get those true principles than to the one who gave them to us from the beginning. Yeah. So some of those upper managers at the beginning <clears throat> might have given this response, and I want to hear what you would have said. They might have said, "Well, George, the you know we're, we're doing business on relationships and trust, and and that's how it's been working, and it works well. You know, our our managers know the carriers. We have a relationship. We have an understanding. Do you want to come in and change all that? What, what do you say to that to a company that's set up on on?" those kind of relationships that can hide a lot of the problems. This is what you do whenever that occurs in any business. It always works. You simply say, just give me three to six months. Tell me to do something different if it doesn't work. That's all I ask for. That won't cost you hardly anything. Just give me three to six months. Let me go out there and then let me come back. And if it doesn't work, you can direct me in a different way. And normally, any reasonable person will give you a testing period, which they did. And it worked. Okay, well thank you again, enjoyed your questions.